Have a seat, have a seat. Um, so we're here to basically talk about new approaches to housing and how you get the equation right. Frankly, there's, there's a lot of stress out there, particularly in low-income areas as cities are growing, uh, to, to kind of make sure that it's just not, you know, one half of the population is doing extraordinarily well and, and the others. And so let me just sort of ask you, just sort of straight up, we're gonna get to you in a second. You're, I mean, I love, uh, this, is, this is a, we'll talk about the dumpster living, which I, you know, they're, they're not, they don't know about yet. But, but um, Laura, let me ask you in terms of how you think about what the barriers to a more inclusive housing reality are today that need to be fixed. Oh, gosh. So, um, you thought this was going to be easy? No, no, no. It's, I mean, so the truth is um, we, we develop and finance and do affordable housing around the country, and you can look at it just as housing, or you can look at it as part of an ecosystem, and I think it's really important that we do both. Things like rising income inequality, um, persistent racial segregation, um, I would even say climate change, right, are affecting the ability to build and develop affordable housing and to sustain that, and I think the big challenge for us is how to not just think about this as housing, but how to think about this as housing connected to opportunities, right? So families have the access to education, to healthcare, to childcare, to transportation that they need to be economically mobile. Because at the root of this problem right. is how our communities grow and thrive, right? And all of these barriers that we're talking about, and we will talk about, I'm sure, here, um, whether that comes from income inequality, whether that comes from, you know, uh, restrictive zoning or challenges with So have, land have you looked at Dallas at all in your, because uh, I know you do deal nationally with these questions yep. of, of finance and affordable housing and getting that picture right. I think Dallas right now has a 3.3% unemployment rate, if I'm right. Uh, it's growing a lot. Their mid-sized cities in America are growing yep. like crazy, and even some of the bigger cities, the mega cities are shrinking a little bit as the mid-sized cities pick up folks. So what do you think Dallas, because we're going to have the mayor up here in a little bit, what do you think he's doing wrong? <laughs> we actually don't do work in Dallas, uh -huh. so I'm going to pass on that. Um, I would say, we're just talking about this in the back, I think the cities like Atlanta and Denver, um, places that are growing, right, is exactly what you said, high, attracting investment, attracting right. talent. Um, there are a lot of lessons from those places that I think you, you guys can think about here. Things like how you consider zoning, how you put more resources towards affordable housing. In case you guys haven't noticed, I think the federal government, um, while we continue to advocate for those resources, they're going down. So mm. the local innovation is really important. We also see solutions happening locally. They're different in different places. So what's the coolest thing out there um, that you've seen, the coolest innovation? I mean, we talked so at a high level on this stuff, but give us the coolest thing in terms of edu you know, talking to people here about you know, promising practices in affordable housing that isn't seen. So I'll look, I'll look at Denver for that example. Denver. We have paired um, a transit-oriented development fund where developers can buy land for mission-oriented and affordable housing development. There's a transit expansion, huge investment happening in that community. So the land can, you know, along, that, along those um, uh, ways to the airport and all of the transit expansion, that land is becoming more valuable. Right. So you need the capital, you need new kinds of capital. We are also seeing really innovative policy and advocacy solutions like um, everything related to housing I just described, more resources, more zoning uh, protections, a source of income discrimination protection I just heard about. I would also add in things related to housing. So we're seeing uh, a reduced fare campaign to ensure mm -hmm. that the lower income families living in those units can actually get to work. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at that, we were talking about this too, that kind of more eco, excuse me, ecosystem and more holistic approach. Right. Cities that are willing to do that and can bring together the private sector, the civic infrastructure, philanthropy, investors. Right. Let's and that's it, yeah. really hard to do, but there are places where it's happening well. So, so Dallas David is the that. investor guy, yeah. right? You're, and, you're, and maybe I could just jump in on, on yeah, what go ahead, Dallas yeah. is going to be facing. Uh, yeah, Dallas was just named by Urban Land Institute and PricewaterhouseCoopers as the number one investment market for uh, you know, yeah, for the upcoming year by you know and emerging trends. Um, I'm from Austin. Austin was number one uh, over the last couple of years, and the challenge with being number one is you got to be careful for you know, what that means in terms of you know growth in the market. Um, you know, Austin's now in a 10-year run of, you know, you know, dramatic economic growth, population growth, all these wonderful things. But what comes with that are the challenges of affordability. You know, we, we, we address uh, workforce affordability, so between 60 and 120 percent 
of, of median income, which really has not been addressed in, in any kind of government program or subsidies or anything like that. Uh, we put together a private equity fund to invest and preserve existing multifamily communities and then maintain them as affordable uh, by limiting our rental rate growth to wage growth. And the, uh, you know, we're, we're probably behind the curve now in, in Austin because of, of this, this wonderful ramp of economic growth that we've had. But, you know, 10 years ago, uh, Austin was the most affordable big city in uh, Texas, and now we're the most expensive. So uh, in a relatively short period of time, things can flip and, and cause dramatic problems. So David, let me ask you, you, you make a very interesting linguistic distinction, and I don't know if it's significant or not. A lot of us talk about low-income housing or affordable housing. You talk about workforce housing. What are, is there a nuance that you're trying to hit us with there that we're not getting? Well, yeah, I think there's, there's, I think affordability is, is really across the spectrum. Uh, right. One is, is homelessness. Um, and I think most people traditionally had thought about affordability ending, um, you know, at, at the low income level, but actually has moved into middle income, uh, into the jobs that, that, you know, really make a city the, the, the place that's really interesting. So it's, it's teachers, it's nurses, uh, you know, in Austin, it's, it's entry level tech workers. Um, and, and, you know, also musicians and artists and all that, that you know, add to the culture of the city. They're the ones now, that are now being uh, hard pressed to afford to live anywhere close to town. You know? Right. And this is, can I jump in yeah. on this point? Because this is actually so important, I think, from a development perspective and also politically, because mm -hmm. you can look at the spectrum and, and understandably, I think public sector resources are, are sort of targeted at the neediest. Um, but this gap exists in many places across the country, and oh, it's definitely. really important to ensuring economic vitality of many places like Austin. Let me just, before I jump to our friend Jeff here, um, who's a super cool guy, by the way, uh, I'm interested in the finance side of this, because in reading my, your background, I know that you're looking for um, essentially socially conscious investors who are willing to mingle some of their money with other pools. So these are obviously people who see that the market is not solving this, so you need to put a thumb and some resources behind that. And I'm interested in, because it sounds a little wobbly if you have to mm -hmm. count on decent people, right? So are there enough decent people out there to, to do the kinds of things you're doing financing, and how do you make it less wobbly over time? Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of say there's people that get it and there's people that don't get it. And um, my job is to get the ones that don't get it to, to move to this other side. Because right. you know, our fund, it's a, it's a private market fund. And uh, we're distributing profits and cash flow onto our investors. But there's an overlay of philanthropy or charity that is providing a social good uh, to the community. And you know, so we're, we're, we're occupying this, this, this land between the two. And um, it's, it, it is challenging because uh, there's folks that look at this as philanthropy and that's, that's the role for philanthropy and where does investment come into this. Uh, there's also folks that have uh, um, been involved with real estate and if you've been involved in real estate for the last 10 years, it's been a pretty decent business and they expect returns that are, that are similar to you know, speculative real estate projects. Um, you know, what we've put together in terms of our fund is, is more of a low risk, uh, long term investment model. You know, we use what's called an open end fund. It's more similar to a mutual fund than it would be to kind of anything else out in the stock world. Um, and, but there, there's, you know, our, our uh, sale to people is uh, uh, kind of appeal to their heart and also appeal to their pain. Uh, you know, people now are beginning to feel when, 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 when your kid's teacher now leaves uh, uh, the Austin Independent School District because they can't afford to drive an hour back and forth anymore, that's where people start getting it. Mm -hmm. And that's where, and, the, and then the same thing goes if you can't retain and attract employees or uh, your favorite musician doesn't live in Austin anymore. Right. Or you know, all these different things are where people begin to get it and it becomes less wobbly. Fascinating, fascinating. So uh, our job now, Jeff uh, Wilson, CEO of Casita, is so interesting to sort of look at this broad question of how do we innovate in an industry, in a housing industry? I mean, right now we've been talking about finance and fairness, if you will, how to get that dimension to the equation right. And, and in, to, to a certain degree, the notion, concept, the way we look at our own private wealth and storing it in home mortgages or home equity of kind of looking at this broadside hasn't been truly disrupted uh, probably in over a century. 
And I know you've been trying to nail that. I don't want to tell you a story. Let's, I think we, we've got some slides we can begin to que queue up. But tell us about Casita and how you're trying to invert some of these assumptions of how we look at housing. Yeah, I mean, housing is the last industry to really be disrupted. I, I called up a professor when I started this project out in West Virginia uh, that studies innovation in the housing industry, and asked him what the large, the, the last massive leap was in terms of innovation and technology and home building, and he said the nail gun. Ah. The nail and gun. I said, well, number two, he said the pre-assembled truss, you know, that little piece of steel. And so, you know, as we went to work on this, uh, we really tried to rethink from the ground up uh, what, what a housing product is. And we went at designing what we call the iPhone of housing, something that is truly mass produced. And so like that's an, what's up here at the that, iPhone. That's what yeah. we have here. Okay. So this is our unit. It's a 352 square foot. Um, and does this actually exist? That is a real picture. Okay. okay. Yeah. You never Had know anymore. You get asked. <laughs> yeah. So we have these. Uh, they're mostly scattered around Austin right now, um, Atlanta, California. They are pre-permitted to drop down in a matter of weeks rather than months or years. Uh, they're made to fit within the cracks in the system. So rather than buying big plots of land, these can go in backyards as ADUs on very small pieces of land and stacked up. And even small cracks in time. We don't think about uh, you know, the three or four or 10 years a piece of dirt may sit in a really good location, like one of these parking lots across the street, um, where we could put housing uh, for a certain amount of time, rent these out, and then move it on when you were going to build up. And so we're really thinking about this much more uh, like a product, something that we can develop a brand around that can be mass manufactured and really get the cost down uh, over time at scale. I think we'll be able to sell these for about $70,000 all in delivered when we get to scale, uh, asterisk. Right now they're not at that cost, but uh, that's the aim to you know, really disrupt and provide um, affordability through innovation, not just affordability and sort of so. A, so take us back a little bit further. I mean, this looks cool. Any of you guys see? I mean, I just flew on a, um, a transatlantic flight last night, and I saw the film on there, which I didn't watch. And so, don't be ashamed if you have did seen it. But the da Matt Damon movie Downsizing. Anybody see it? God, Matt Damon doesn't. Yes, yeah, right over yeah. here. Yeah, there's somebody. Well, then this this falls flat on you because there is essentially at least one scene where there's a, a, a wall. Of, of dumpsters, and I'm fascinated that part of your experience and comes to understand how to upend the housing notion was living yeah. in a dumpster for a while. Can you just share yeah, so a little bit about that? Yeah, so it wasn't quite that. And, that, and I said, true. honey, I yeah. shrunk the kids, and yeah. you said, man, you're old. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, as part of a uh, experiment in sort of the smallest space one could possibly live in, uh, I sold off everything I owned for a dollar an item at one point. I was a professor at the time um, and moved into a 33 square foot dumpster for a year. And the idea was to sort of, you know, explore living in a very small footprint but also just breaking down all the sort of uh, notions of how we think about housing right now. And that, that was actually the experiment. I left my job as a professor, went and raised some money and founded this startup about three years ago. And, and, and as I understand it, you're being in their help and, and the, the innovator that you worked with, um, I was reading you, that, that, that it's much more than a box that you have, that you're talking to walls, that you've created something to anticipate you coming home and, the, you know, the queen bed come, you know, kitchen becomes a queen bed somehow. I mean, I don't know how much I have this right, but it sounds like much more than what we're seeing in the picture. Yeah, we've, you know, designed every cubic inch of that space for the experience of living with the idea that you can get a lot more from a lot less. Now, obviously, this isn't for a family of four at this point. Um, we can connect these modules and make them into larger uh, units, but there's also technology embedded in it. So if you think about like your iPhone, there's only a couple of different sizes and a couple of different colors, but everybody feels like it's their own. 
if we're mass producing hundreds of thousands of these casitas and sending them out to the world like you would a car, uh, you want to feel like you have your own experience. So we can adapt to different moods. It's a fully integrated uh, piece of hardware and software, really. Let me ask Lauren and David, do you see this is a totally crazy idea that's irrelevant to what you do, or do you see opportunities of working in ways to address some of what you think, of worker housing, of, of fairness, of dealing with some of the, you know, essentially, I want to say bigotry and, 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 and essentially divides in society. Or do you see an opportunity in what Absolutely. Jeff is doing? Absolutely. I, I think the question of housing costs and access to housing is, a, this, this kind of thinking is a great solution, and I love your point about disruption, because it really, really hasn't come, like there's no clear Uber, you know, for our industry yet. Um, and so I love the idea that you're, that you're developing this. We're also seeing this in other contexts like disaster recovery, right? Like the mother of invention is necessity. And so people are looking at ways to build smaller units and, you know, some of the work we're doing in Houston on disaster recovery involves that. So I think it's absolutely the right direction. And, um, you know, we, we are sort of of the industry. We're, we're you know, we, we finance, we do the work on the ground, but I think we, we are definitely keeping our eye on these kinds of disruptions and want to support them where we can because it is necessary to, to ensuring that we address all these big problems. David? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things, I mean, I, you know, for instance, our, our, our fund is a traditional fund. We're just taking something that's traditional and moving in a completely different direction. Um, and, and you can kind of look at, at what you've done is a similar way. This is, this is a, a living unit, but it's also been moving in a completely different direction. I think one of the, the, the fascinating aspects is, you know, what we're buying are 80s, 90s, 2000 vintage properties. I mean, they were designed for what the need was way back when. Um, but we've begun to look at, can we take a one bedroom unit, for instance, you know, add a, a modern Murphy bed to it, and make it into something where a single uh, parent could have a child and, and what would be the traditional one bedroom, they can now use then the, the living room for, for daily living and then you know, add, add a bedroom there. But that, what that does though, it you know, increases the density of people using what we have there. Um, one of our challenges though is we start running into then city code issues and maybe financing issues and, and because you're, you start bending what is normal. And you know, I think one of the challenges of being an innovator is that you know you you have to encourage everybody to come along with you, right? You know, so you're educating people on yeah, how, how to get them to come along in the dumpster. <laughs> <on that button>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the other fascinating thing is um, I didn't know Jeff. We we're both from Austin, but I did know I, I had heard about this guy named Dr. Dumpster. Um, so your reputation. Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is Dr. Dumpster. <laughs> and you but. Smell it, a little better. I think <laughs> yeah. when you're living in the dumpster. Um, but I think that's one of the real challenges on, on, on bringing innovation in, especially something as, as uh, kind of formalized as housing, is that the, you're moving you know, one of these huge super tankers in order to kind of come, have, come along with you in terms of the traditional financing models, uh, traditional uh, zoning and, and land use. Um, and one of the things I would love to be able to do with, with Casita is that if we have extra parking or something like that, we could bring and add units to an existing uh, property and increase our density on unused parking spaces. I mean, that's an easy way to do things. And if you would do it at 70,000 a unit, well, that would be perfect. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do think it's very interesting. You know, when you look at the housing in, um, at the Atlantic, we had a lot of things that come in and we, we published something called City Lab and you sort of look at other elements, you know, for instance, of looking at how um, I don't know if I would want to live there, but you know, there are more pods now, particularly for, for um, those that are beyond work doing aging, but creating fantastic kind of community shared uh, opportunities and experiences, but then shrinking uh, the living space. But I think part of the question, which I just, because you're both finance experts, is to kind of come in, is is there an opportunity here that 20 years from now we will have sort of shed the notion that someone's private wealth, that they work and save, pay off a house, the whole dimensions of mortgages, you know, it, it, it reminds me, go back to sort of Viking days, people used to carry jewelry around to carry their wealth. People carry around homes to carry their wealth, and you see them often undermined by financial crises and whatnot. Do we need to get another major strategic leap in the way we look at what we're about and how we save and, 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 and throwing it in a home and, and just toss that away somehow? Which of course would be painful, but do you think it'll be a healthier society? I mean, the American dream is to own a house, right? right. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do with our fund is actually balance the needs of our investors with the needs of our residents. 
or bringing in services that will allow the residents to uh, gain financial literacy, maybe do financial planning, save money, and then have the choice. You know, they could they could go uh, lease a better place. They could go buy something. Right. You know, I don't think it's our position to say you should yeah. go buy something. Is is really more that let, let people have the choice. Right. And I think that may be the new dynamic right. for America is have you know providing choice. Right, Laurel. I think that's exactly right. I, 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 I don't think our culture is going to change that fundamentally. It is such a part of us. Also, place is really important. You know, where, you're, where you live and in a digital world, I think that's not going to go away, actually. Hmm. So I would say it's about having choices. It's about having access. It's about more flexible models, as you were saying, right. different, at different stages of life. Right. And I think that's where... Before I ask Jeff, just, just to say, and, and when they go to the audience, uh, you used to work for HUD? Housing and Urban Development. Tell us the worst thing that HUD does that you'd like to see fixed. So, um, I will and I take, don't mean I will take a, the I mean, I mean in a time. constructive way of actually solving these problems. Um, we have many. Uh, we know a lot now about how to fight poverty through housing in the built environment. Right. And many of the programs at HUD, while they're important, are I would say legacy mm. and are both underfunded to solve the problems that they're designing to solve, like the housing voucher program. Right and they're um, administered in a challenging way for a whole bunch of reasons. So what I would love to do is say, how could you redesign the system, right? Mm. If your goal is to provide subsidies, give people choice, whatever yeah. the vehicle is to do things like maybe buy a casita or live in Austin, right. there's a lot of ways we could do that now that the HUD was not designed for. Right, Jeff? Uh, I was just going to jump in on the, the, the point before the last one. Um, I think the way that societal trends are moving right now, um, I don't think it's going to be a lot longer till you see a, a decoupling of this mindset between my wealth is stored in some bricks and sticks that right. I'm tied to for 30 years in this particular place. I think there's going to be a decoupling between sort of living the life I want to live mm. and then taking that income and placing it into some sort of structure or fund where you can still benefit from what you would get from that equity accruing right. while still sort of living the life mobile. that you want to live. Much yeah. more mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Let me go to the audience and questions. Such an interesting panel. And then, yes, right here, this gentleman. We have a microphone to you. Here we go. Hi. Order P. Jim. Um, quick question for uh, Dr. Dumpster. Um, so can you kind of explain your concept versus like mobile home park or the shipping containers? So, sorry? Can you kind of explain the difference oh, in the your difference. concept yeah. versus like mobile home park right. or, so, or a shipping container? So I, I can tell you that both is shipping... Is that where Connex is? Uh, Connex, okay, yeah. Great. So I can tell you that both uh, from experience that both shipping containers and dumpsters... Have you lived in both? Uh, ...make great uh, sort of things to, to ship in or to dump trash in. Both of them are horrible for living in. Um, particularly when you take uh, a, you know, the, the container parks that you see and you see these stack, you, you meet a lot of people that do one of those container parks. You don't mm. meet a lot of people that do a second one. Uh, it's very expensive to get them up to a code where they're actually permissible and mm. just livable. Um, we also are classed as a single family home, as a modular home, so you can go out and get a Fannie Mae loan on these. We've also pre-permitted them at the state level. So the only thing the city of Dallas is allowed to inspect when you bring a casita to your backyard or your lot is the foundation and the connections. Everything else is already pre-checked off in the factory, and this allows us to scale and deploy these. You can't one-click order one on Amazon uh, yet, uh, maybe if the drones get a little bit uh, more powerful, we might be able to do that one day. In terms of the price of a home with all that permitting and time, what are the um, gains you're getting real quickly? Just uh, A lot of it's in just time and hassle. Anybody right. that's ever built a home no, and, horrible, and waited for but... every level of the inspectors from the city to come out, uh, a, a lot of it is just pain and time. And, and, and probably years on your life. Uh, <laughs> yes, right over here. Amy Stanfield with PGM Ref. Um, also a question for Jeff. Um, how do you picture your casita homes? Is it going to be more of a community of these homes, right. or are they going to kind of be spread out through cities? Will we start yeah. seeing that? Great or? question. Yeah. Does, does clustering, I mean, I'm always going to ask the same thing. Does clustering 
help or hurt that do you, do you care? Yeah, so we see it in two ways, right? We're building these um, in California right now. We're distributing them around in backyards where folks may have them as a granny flat or from a wayward millennial that didn't get a job uh, after college that wants to move back in. Um, and then we're also clustering them. In South Austin, there's a group called Constellation that's bought a piece of dirt. Uh, they're putting 40 casitas in a community down there. Folks are getting mortgages on these casitas and it's like a condo regime, right? To where for about 11, 1200 bucks, you can own a, a home in Austin and pay a small condo fee there and live in a kind of community with a pool and a kind of co-working space. And I, I think this could be done with uh, almost any kind of community you wanted. Great, right here. Bruce Harris with uh, Harris Advisory. This is for David, question for you. With respect to your fund, have you seen a difference or allocation of who's really interested in your fund? Is it millennials or is it uh, the older individuals? And also, are you seeing having a social impact of this fund, although it may be 100% total impact, but having a portion of this fund been an, an effective marketing tool just to grow your entire fund itself? Thank you. Yeah, so our, our, our fund, uh, we're launching our fund with high net worth investors in, in Austin, um, and now we're beginning to move into more foundations, social impact funds, even institutional investors. Uh, the, there's been an interesting split uh, because uh, there, there are certain folks, you know, and there's actually been an age split about 45 years old. Uh, those over 45, uh, when I say this is a bond equivalent type of uh, investment with low risk, mm -hmm. they go, I get it, I'll just allocate money out of my you know, fixed income portfolio. A number of people, especially in Austin, uh, with the tech community, if they're younger than 45, I've had people say, uh, what's a bond? And you know, why, would I, why would I take a low risk investment? And you know, um, they, had, and they haven't really gone through a, a real estate cycle and, and, a, and a recession. Uh, but then they become interested when, they've, you know, when they identify with some of the, uh, the challenges, either in retaining right. workforce or uh, you know, how this personally impacted right. them. Um, as we move beyond there, you, yeah. know, you know, foundations get it, um, other, other uh, organizations get it that have social impact. And I, I think you know, once we build our track record, we just bought our first deal. So we're, we're now progressing on to build a track record. That type of capital will be somewhat easier to get once we prove up what we, what we can do. Thank you. Laura, let me ask you the, the final question before we wrap up. Um, one of the things that often comes up, again, I think about five years from now, 10 years from now, how will the world look differently? And one of the things you see, at least in highly urban, dense areas, is, uh, you know, tra transportation is changing, or maybe we may see autonomous vehicles, we may see a very different way in which parking permitting is thinking. So a lot of times I talk to people about building housing, and one of the constraints is, well, they have to come with, you know, the, the concomitant uh, uh, parking uh, dramatic. I mean, there are lots of stuff out there that constrains this. And just give us your crystal ball, because kind of, you're in this, you see what's going on nationally. Is anybody able to shed those kinds of requirements to make the housing problem much easier than it is today, anywhere that, that's in your purview? Uh, not yet. Not yet. I think these emerging cities, I was talking about whether it's actually, I, I come from New York, and I think in some ways that's a very advanced, but also kind of, um, a little bit stuck, right? In New York and San Francisco, they, they've been dealing with affordability for a right. long time. I think places like, places in Texas here, um, Austin, but also Atlanta, Denver, I think they have that kind of mix of innovation, the right people at the table. But no, I don't think people have figured that out yet. I think in, as an industry, we aren't thinking enough about autonomous vehicles as a good example, right? That could open up vast amounts of land. <laughs> and, 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 decrease the cost dramatically. and decrease the cost dramatically. So this is a, a toe in the door on a lot of issues. We're going to jump to the next session, sir, but I'll come back and make sure that when I'm up, we come to you first, okay? Uh, big round of applause for David Steinwoodell. Good luck with the fun. Yeah. Laurel Blanchford and Jeff Wilson. Great. Best of luck with Casita. Thank you all very much.